Hello and welcome to this episode of Live by Design, a program where I hope you will find content that is informative, insightful, and inspiring. I'm your host, Moadi Dabinga. I'm a life strategist and a motivational speaker. And today is Tuesday, February 19th, 2013. So how are you doing in this cold season that we love to call the winter of our lives. I'm doing pretty well. I'm in DC right now. It's a little chillier than, than normally expected, I think, anyway, at this time, but it's not too bad. Um, if you follow my newsletters, you'll know that I made a promise to myself that this year I was not going to complain about the snow, the cold at all. I was going to just ride the wave and sort of be in the moment and really try to enjoy it and not worry about when spring um, is going to come. And I'm happy to say that for the most part, I've been um, sticking to that pretty well. I was in Boston during um, the Nemo blizzard, and I didn't complain. I went out and I shoveled and I enjoyed the view of the snow from the warmth of, you know, my mother's apartment and all that fun stuff. But I will say this. When Amtrak resumed service, I was on one of the first trains out of there. I love being in Boston with my family. Um, I know a lot of really wonderful people in Boston, but that snow was just a little, just a little, a little bit too much for me to go around. So here I am in DC. Um, I've been really pretty busy these last couple of weeks. I've been here for a while working, spending time with the family. Next week I head off to New York. One of my favorite young people has a performance at Juilliard, and so I'm really looking forward to going and supporting him in that. And while I'm there, of course, I'm going to spend some time with some of my other favorite young people who now make New York City their home. Now, a couple of other announcements. One, I am excited that I will be uh, presenting a workshop called Putting the You Back in Youth Reach at the Massachusetts Cultural Council's annual Youth Reach Conference. It's taking place on March 28th in Boston, actually in Worcester, Massachusetts. And it's a big convening of all of the grantees and other people who work in this industry, in the youth arts, um, who come together annually to share ideas, eat ideas, share experiences, and hear about what the Massachusetts Cultural Council, or MCC for short, um, has been up to. I'm really particularly excited about my workshop because the theme of my workshop is really focused around how can we encourage, or how can I encourage, people who are in this work, youth service providers, youth artists, um, art teachers, and performing artists who work with young people, how can we continue to make sure that we get joy out of our work? And how can we create a life-work balance that allows us to come to work and be energized and be fulfilled and feel good about what we do and avoid the, the burnout that usually sort of plagues people who do nonprofit public service work, especially those of us that work with young people, because it can be very challenging and it can be emotionally draining at times. And if we don't come into this work with a real clear sense of intention, but a real understanding that we can show up fully in our work without burning ourselves out, without um, sort of advocating the truth of who we are. If we're not really clear about that, we can get burnt out pretty easily and we become frustrated and we can lose the joy. And just because we uh, commit to doing a life of service work, which is very important, it does not mean that we sort of give up our right to still have joy and have abundance and have peace and really have a sense of well-being. And sometimes, not all of us, but some of us in this field, and I think I've been guilty of this myself in the past, sometimes we forget that we're part of that community that we're trying to uplift or we're trying to transform as well. And so the purpose of my workshop is to really lift that up and create a space where those of us who are doing this work can really come together and examine where have we um, pulled ourselves out? Where have we uh, sort of abandoned ourselves? Where have we abandoned ourselves as artists? You know, a lot of people who come to the work as our teaching artists are artists. That's the operative word, right? But we lose our art sometimes in service to this bigger vision. So I'm excited about that conversation. Again, it's on March 28th in Worcester, Massachusetts, and it's sponsored by the Massachusetts Cultural Council. So if you are in town and you are so inclined, I hope that you will join me for that. I'm also pleased to announce, well, I can't really give a whole lot of details, but yesterday I got verbal confirmation that I was um, selected to participate participate in a national conference that's taking place in July in Philadelphia. 
I'm not going to give out any of the details. I'm not even going to say who it is simply because I haven't gotten that written confirmation yet. And, you know, until folks put things in writings, um, as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't exist. But I'm excited about it. I have a little extra energy today, and I'm looking forward to sharing the details of that with you in the future. Um, if now, if you want to reach out to me about speaking or at your organization or doing a workshop for your group, please feel free to contact my management agency, m3dagency.com. That's M as in Mary, the number three, D as in David, agency.com. If you reach out to them, they are the, that is the perfect space to get information about how to bring me to your group and they can talk about logistics and all of that fun stuff. I really do enjoy speaking to new groups of people, to young people, to diverse groups of people. I don't just speak to women when I go out in public. So if you're interested in bringing yours truly to your space, m3dagency.com is a place for you to go. One more announcement, my family's organization, Origination Cultural Arts Center, uh, if you watched the show before, you've heard me speak about this group um, on several occasions. Uh, we're closing in on our 20th year of service, and we are in the process of a capital campaign to move into a new space. We're trying to raise funds so that we can move into a new location that will allow the organization to serve more young people, to serve them in a better fashion, and will really help promote our longevity, our longevity, I should say, our sustainability in the long term. So if you haven't already done so, you can go to GoFundMe.com, GoFundMe.com, and do a quick search for origination, and you will find an appeal from my sister, Shalom Bayanta Dabinga, who is the founder and the current artistic and executive director. And she explains what the purpose of the move is, what the purpose of origination is, and how you can be of support. If you've already given, thank you. We really thank you. There's no donation that's too small. $5, $25, $2,500. Hey, if you want to write us a check for $25,000, we'll take that too. Um, but if you've given already, we thank you so much. You can always give again. And if you haven't, I really encourage you to check out the site and see if it's something that you might support. I don't plug a lot of organizations, as you can see on this show, because I'm very selective about where I give my time. And I'm also very selective about who I refer out, like who I invite in, um, or who I invite to join me in supporting organizations that I care about. And origination is at the top of my list. So again, GoFundMe.com search origination in their little search box and then you can give and you can share with us so those are all of my announcements for now we're going to take a quick break remember you can keep up with everything that i do by following me or joining me i should say on twitter on facebook and linkedin that's it remember i don't do all those other ones or you could also send me an email at mdabinga at moadiunlimited.com and i would be happy to speak to you and engage with you and share any information that i possibly can to help you in your journey. All right, I think that's all. Yeah, those are all my announcements. So we're gonna take a very quick break and I will be right back. Welcome back to Live by Design. I'm your host, Mwadi Gavinga. I just realized during our break that in the first segment, I think I used the word chillier. And you know what? I know that's not a word. <laughs> so it's kind of, it's making me laugh. And I was going to go out and go back and edit it out, but I decided I'm not going to. I'm not perfect and neither are you. So I'm leaving it in there. But please, don't email me, don't text, book, text message me, and please do not send me a Facebook post telling me the proper use of the word chili. I know what it is, I made a mistake. I think it's funny, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it in. Now today, let's get into our topic, okay? Today we're talking about this concept of service consciousness and how bringing service consciousness into your workplace on an everyday basis can not only transform your work experience, but can also transform, for the better, the experience of the people that you work with. And I'll tell you what I mean by this. Um, a few, last month it was, we celebrated in the U.S. Uh, a National Day of Service in honor of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And as part of that day of service, scores of people descended upon parks and nonprofit organizations and other spaces where they engaged in volunteer work for the day. 
Um, and, you know, I was in Boston on that day. I was on the bus going somewhere else, and I saw a big group of young people with um, cleaning supplies and some other things which suggested to me that they were taking part as a group in service day, a um, national day of service, rather. And I, I, and I stopped and I thought, and I've had this thought before, but it really um, came to me in a big wave on that day. I questioned, why is it? That was the question for me that day. Why is it that we cannot bring that same sense of service consciousness to our everyday work, to our everyday lives. Rather than doing that, what most of us do, us do rather, is we complain. We complain about our jobs. We complain about our coworkers. We complain about our bosses. We complain about our commute. We complain about everything that has to do with our jobs. So much so that it has, I think, a real negative impact, not only on our perspective about our work, but I think it's so strong that it sometimes seeps into every other parts of our lives. Or conversely, or maybe it's a reflection of how we think about other parts of our lives. But my point is that Rather than spending time complaining about our jobs and complaining about our bosses and complaining about our work, how can we transform that situation? How can we transform our perspective so that we can bring that same level of dignity, honor, grace, and positive energy that we do to our volunteer work into the places where we actually get paid to work? I first remember having this concept years ago when I was living in New York. And I was taking the bus back to Boston. I love taking the bus. Not really. Um, but anyway, I got to the bus station and there was a gentleman there who worked for Greyhounds. He had a nice, you know, red vest and the white shirt. Um, young brother. He was probably like maybe in his 20s, maybe early, th early 30s. And he came up to me with just all this enthusiasm. Hello, ma'am. How are you? Can I help you? He wanted to help me with my bags, make sure I got to my gate. I mean, was just really, really attentive and really excited and enthusiastic about what he was doing. And, I, and, and our exchange was wonderful. I mean, I was actually happy about taking the bus. And, and, and trust me, I'm, I'm not a bus person for a host of reasons we won't even get into. But on that day, the bus, you know, the whole process of getting to the bus was a really pleasant experience for me. And at, at one point I thought to myself, is he coming on to me? Like, is he trying to, you know, is he trying to holler, as the young people would say. Um, but I noticed after he dropped me off at gate number 84, and I watched him, and because, you know, I'm nosy, he was like that with everybody. Male, female, young, old, attractive, not attractive, not attractive, it didn't matter. He brought that same level of attention and enthusiasm and energy, just positive um, vibes to every experience. And I was really impressed by that because his was not a job that we typically, we don't think of it up as being glamorous or being exciting. You know, a lot of these young people today would rather do anything than have a job in public service, like, you know, whether doing customer service, particularly in that capacity. And so for him, in that space to still be able to bring that level of just joy and exuberance to what he was doing, I was really, really impressed by that. It really, really moved me. And when I think back now on that that energy, it's the same type of energy that we bring to our service work. There's something glamorous about doing community service. There's something that we feel is noble about exchanging our energy just for appreciation, not for any monetary value, value just for appreciation. And because we know that we're being appreciated just for what we're doing, just for who we are, just for what we're bringing to the table, we get excited. We get amped. You know, we were in Ghana, myself and a group of dancers from Origination Cultural Arts Center in August. And one of the things that we did, we did a service project where we went in and we painted a, a school. We painted the classroom and the library for a school. I don't paint. I do anything to avoid painting. When we're in Boston, and my mother gets it in her head that she wants to do a design project, or one of my sisters wants to redo one of the studios, and it's time to paint. Marty, may, I'm, I'm conveniently not available because I don't enjoy it. I just don't like it. But there was something about being in that space and knowing and visualizing where you know it was going to really have such an impact that made the painting experience almost a spiritual experience. And I had I got a lot of joy out of that. And I did, as I was painting, think about how I avoid painting and origination. And I started to think about why, what if you brought this energy and this attention to that, to that space, this kind of consciousness in that space, how would it transform the painting for you at origination? Now, as I said at the top of the show, we're going to be moving soon. 
So I have an opportunity to test this theory when we start painting in this space. So I'll get back to you on that one. But my point, my point, let's not lose my point, is that we don't have to wait until we're in a certain situation or we're volunteering to bring that kind of grace, that kind of dignity, that kind of energy, that kind of noblesse, right, into our workspace. We can bring that into the everyday experience we have at work. Yes, we're getting a monetary um, compensation. We're being compensated monetarily for the work that we do. And sometimes we don't feel appreciated. Sometimes we don't feel that we're being paid in a way that's consistent with what we're giving or that we're being respected or treated in a way that reflects um, what we're giving. But part of that, part of how we're treated might be um, connected to, or the how we're treated, I should say, I believe, I know, is definitely connected to how we walk in the space of work. All right, I'm hoping this is making sense because I've been really excited about this topic for a long time. I don't have a whole lot of tolerance these days for people who chronically complain about their workspace and their jobs and their situations because I know that you, because you, you do have a choice. It's a difficult choice, but it's a choice nonetheless. You can quit. That's always an option. I've done it. Right. But people say, oh, I can't. You absolutely can. You can choose to quit and deal with the consequences and the circumstances of that. Or you can choose into that, choose to walk into that workplace with a different type of consciousness, thereby changing your experience and the experience of the people around you. We're going to take a little break. We're going to pick this up. We're going to talk a little bit about why it is that we do all this complaining and all this poo-pooing and all this naysaying at the workplace and, 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 and how it impacts us. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what we can do to turn things around, okay? So we're going to take a really quick break. Don't go anywhere. We well, have to go get a drink of water. You can do that. But, it, but don't go too far, okay? We'll be right back. Welcome back to Live by Design. I'm your host, Mwadi Dibenga, and today we're talking about service consciousness, a consciousness of service. How can we bring more of that into our day-to-day -day work experiences? Now, in the last segment, I shared with you an example of a young man who I met, a staff person at the Greyhound bus terminal years ago, who really, really um, exemplified that for me. He was a professor personification of what it means to bring a sense of real service consciousness to his work. He was engaging, he was thoughtful, he was energized, he was enthusiastic, he was just a, a ball of energy that made my experience at the Greyhound station that day wonderful. And there hasn't been one um, experience that I've had since Amtrak, Greyhound, any other transportation um, experience that I've had with public transportation, I should say, that rivaled that at all. And, and it was such a blessing. He was a blessing to me that day. And as again, as I said, as I watched him engage, engage with other people, he really um, was committed to sharing that energy with other people. Let's talk a little bit about why it is he's the exception to the rule or seems to be the exception to the rule. Why is it that many of us spend so much time complaining about um, where we work or bringing that negative kind of um, doldrum energy into our workplace. Now, again, I'm not talking about people who have extreme work environments where um, they're the subject of harassment or unruly and, and, and really just mean, for want of a better word, bosses. Though that Those situations absolutely do exist. So we are not talking about the extreme forms. I'm just talking about folk who regularly, on the day-to-day -day basis, can't open their mouth to talk about their job without saying something negative or something that's just less than positive, right? If you want to um, be, be a little bit more direct. So I think there are, the, the, there are three reasons that I have identified what I'm going to consider to be sort of the top three reasons that we do this. The first reason that a lot of us engage in negative behavior, negative commentary around our workplace situation is just habit. It's a habit that we develop. Negativity is a habit. And when you spend a fair amount of time, over time, speaking negative and negatively about a situation or a person, it becomes part of your subconscious. It becomes something that you do naturally without even knowing it. I, I, I would bet that if I were to ask some of the folks who I have in mind who constantly are complaining to me about their jobs, why it is that they complain so much about their jobs, if I brought it to their attention, they probably wouldn't even realize how much they do it. Now, again, there's some people, like I have some really close people in my family and some friends right now who are going through some really, really tough, tough 
um, challenging experiences right now at work. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the people who just, for no reason, nothing that they can put their finger on, really just want to complain. And that's a habit. It's a habit that they've started that they can't seem to break free from. The second reason, the second of the top three reasons that I believe that a lot of us engage in this kind of behavior is because we like to bond behind negativity. I got that phrase and that concept from my friend Rita, who's been on this show before. And bonding behind negativity means that that's where our peer group is. We want to belong. We want to fit in. We don't want to be the standalone person who's, who's happy about their job and jovial if 90% or even 50% of the other staff people are, you know, complaining and chronically just, you know, dogging out the entire work experience. So what we do is that's a way that we connect with other people. We connect through our negativity. There are a lot of ways that we can connect with people. But in the workplace, what I have discovered, I've been working since I was 13. That's over 30 years. What I have known to be true is that there is always or often a contingent of folk who bond behind the negativity. It's their peer group. And I think it's interesting because we often tell young people, our children, be your own person, don't follow the crowd, make your own decisions. If Johnny jumped off a bridge, would you do it too? But that yet we, when we become adults, we're not conscious about the ways that we do that same type of um bonding that same sort we're not conscious i should say about how we succumb to peer pressure how we succumb to this feeling of wanting to be to be a uh, part of the group of wanting to belong not wanting to be that sore thumb that sort of sticks out over here but we want to be part of the fingers in the in on the other side of the, the mitten right so we don't really pay attention to that but it's we are bonding behind negativity it just becomes the thing to do whether it's at lunch or at break or on Facebook or on inter-office emails, just complaining, complaining, complaining. It's, it's what we do. The third thing is that, a uh, third reason, or one of the top reasons why I feel that like we do this is because we have a real sense of powerlessness. And it may be powerlessness at our job, or it may be powerlessness in other areas of our lives. And so, but we bring that sense of not feeling like we're in control of our lives to the workplace and it just becomes a natural outlet because it's sort of part of the culture um, unless you're out really cussing people out and really you know doing physical harm to them um, it's sort of accepted that there's going to be that sort of element of people just not liking their job so it's a good outlet to release some of these negative emotions that may not really at their core at their root have anything to do with your job in the first place it might be a reflection of something that's happening elsewhere and but rather than addressing it elsewhere Right? So maybe you have a, 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 a persistent problem with your spouse or significant other. Maybe you're having some challenges in your parenting. Maybe you're having some, having some challenges with your health or some have some challenges with, you know, with your, your physical strength or whatever that might be. Maybe it's not related to the workplace, but the workplace is a safe and acceptable environment for us to complain. We oftentimes do not want to confront um, the problems at home as readily as we will in the workplace. You know, I always say that if you're having di um, dis discontent or, or challenges at home, you know, those are invitations for a conversation. And if you don't answer the invitation at the source, you're going to have that conversation in a space that has nothing to do with your initial problem. So again, the top three reasons that we do this, it's a habit that we form that we're sometimes not even aware of. It allows us to have a peer group because we bond behind the negativity and it allows us not to be the sore, you know, the, the sore thumb that sort of sticks out instead of a happy-go-lucky person because we're in this group of like-minded people who don't like the job and don't like the boss. And also because we're acting out on a sense of powerlessness about something that may be going on at work, but nine times out of 10 has nothing to do with happening in the workplace. It's happening outside of the workplace, but we don't want to confront it. How do we move past this behavior? How do we move past it? First thing, three suggestions. I think I have three. The first one, every morning, set an intention, write it down, that you will bring the best of who you are to your workplace. And then as you go through the day, as you remember it, you don't want to become a slave to this intention, but as you think about and reflect on this intention, Check your actions, check your conversations, check the way you do your work against that intention. Gossiping about your boss or your coworker is not in alignment with the intention of bringing you the best of who you are. Not being productive, spending time on Facebook and Twitter and email and all things that have nothing to do with your work are not in alignment with bringing the best of who you are. Coming late, 
chronically, leaving early, and taking excessively long lunch breaks is not are not actions that are consistent with bringing the best of who you are to the workplace. So how do we start to turn around this behavior? We make sure that we set an intention to bring the best of who we are to the workplace and check our actions against that. Second thing, shift your attitude, shift it. Shift your perspective to an attitude of gratitude. Be grateful. And not just grateful that you have a job. Because people always say that. Oh, you should just be grateful that you have a job. Nah, you know, we don't want to live from that space. We're just grateful to have any old thing. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about while you're in that space, while you choose to stay on the job, be grateful that you have an opportunity every day to get up, get dressed, and go somewhere where you can develop your skills, where you can deliver your gifts. And there are two ways that you can do that. You can deliver your skills and your gifts through the actual work that you do. So if you're a secretary or an administrative assistant and you're really an organized kind of person. That's a gift. That's a skill. You can do that like no other person. If you are a teacher, you can get up in front of your class, no matter how unruly and how, and I know about children in school because I have a family full of teachers. You can still come and make a decision that I'm going to, I have a gift. I have something to share. So I'm going to give it. So delivering the skill sets, right, that are in alignment with or part of your job description, that's one way of showing your gifts. That's one way of developing skills. Another way to develop yourself and really shine is by your attitude in times of conflict. If you look at your workplace as a classroom, that is designed to give you opportunities to grow yourself spiritually and to get some strength and some inner strength and exercise some spiritual muscle to borrow from some, some from Oprah and others, that spiritual, that idea of spiritual muscle, that's a gift and you should be grateful for it. Your job, your place of employment is a place for you maybe to develop or exhibit your patience. Your job or your place of employment is a place for you to develop or exhibit your kindness. It can be a place for you to develop or exhibit your compassion. If you make the choice to be there, and that's our third thing that you can do to shift a little bit. Oh, I should say maybe that's our fourth thing. I'm, I'm running out of the, I'm losing track, but I'm going to check myself in a minute. But if you choose to stay on the job, if you choose to get up every morning and go to that place, why not take advantage of whatever opportunity comes your way for growth and development? So the growth and development might become in your personal, professional skill set. You might be able to learn or develop a new skill. Or you might take whatever challenges, real or otherwise, or obstacles or problems that you see, use them to your advantage. Use them for your further growth, for your further expansion, to, to allow qualities that are already within you to emerge and strengthen and solidify. Bringing that kind of energy, that kind of intention to the workplace, right? Where you recognize this is a place for me to grow. This is a place where I'm going to be tested. This is a place for me to get something that when I leave here is just for me, that can better me, bringing that kind of attitude of gratitude into your workplace can shift your energy, can shift your experience. It can transform that space for you and uh, for others as well. So we don't have to sort of sit in a space of just being unhappy and being chronically just bored or upset or annoyed or whatever it is, whatever that energy is that you're bringing to the workplace. You can choose to walk through it differently. So again, it's a habit that we can break. There is a desire to bond behind the negativity that you can move away from. And there may be feelings of helplessness that if you address elsewhere will allow you to sort of clear the fog and see your workplace in a different way, right? And in addition to that, you can set an intention to bring the best of who you are. Challenge yourself every day. No matter what is said to me, no matter what is done to me, I'm going to bring the best of who I am. If I have to respond to something and that, that that's done to me, if I have to check somebody or confront somebody, I'm going to do that because I'm not going to be a doormat. But I'm going to do it in a way that reflects the best of who I am. I'm going to use this opportunity to grow, to develop my, my to develop my muscles, also my spiritual muscles, and also I am going to use this opportunity to fully engage and give my gifts. Yes, I'm being uh, compensated monetarily and financially. Maybe not the best pay in the world. Maybe I don't have someone, um, a supervisor, a boss who really values me, but I value myself. And because I value myself, I am going to give the best of who I am. 
to this place because I deserve that for myself. I deserve the benefit of what being the best does for me, right? And I'm gonna bring some service consciousness, some sacred service consciousness. I'm gonna make my job, doing my job, an act of sacred service for as long as I'm here. You can always quit, you can leave. It's, it's, it, it may be a difficult choice, but you do have a choice. It is a choice nonetheless. But if you choose to stay, if you choose to get up in the morning every day and take the time to get dressed and do whatever you need to do to come into work, why not bring the best of who you are? Why not bring the best of your intentions? Why not approach your work like it's sacred service? Not for anybody else, although they will benefit. They will, there's a byproduct, a positive byproduct that you will sort of generate from acting that way, but because it will serve you. Think about going to your job as if you were going to a sacred service project and act accordingly. You will be surprised. I almost, I guarantee it. You will be surprised by how just that shift in perspective and how that shift in energy can transform your space and bring opportunities to you, bring peace to you, maybe bring some abundance to you that you couldn't even have foreseen before. Foreseen before. You know what I mean, right? So that's my message for today. Bring that same idea, that same spirit of sacredness, of energy, of honor, of grace, of dignity that you bestow on others when you're doing your volunteer work. Bring that to your job today and see how what that does for you. That's all I have for you today. Before I close, I want to make one quick note. A spiritual teacher by the name of Debbie Ford uh, passed away two days ago. I just was introduced to her work recently and um, I'm still trying to sort of figure out her work. She does this um, body of work called the shadow process and the shadow project and I find it very fascinating. I don't know a lot about it but I'm, I'm intrigued by it and even though she's passed and made her transition I'm going to continue to study and learn it. But one thing that I tend to do when people pass away is I look for images of them. I just, for some reason, it really made me sad. You know, I, I've heard her on the radio. I saw her speaking in some places um, on television and it, it, it did, it did make me sad. So I went on her Facebook page and I just looked at all of her pictures and she had been battling or dealing, living with cancer for 10 years. And up until 2011, 2000 last year even, was still posting pictures of her traveling around the world while dealing with her illness. 2009, she was in Istanbul and some other places. And it really made me think that she lived her life so fully. She passed away at 57, which is very young. But in those 57 years, it seems like she squeezed as much out of her life as possible. So before I close, my message to you is this. You don't have to wait to a cat for a catastrophic illness or some type of major traumatic life event to make the decision to show up in your life fully. Don't wait for that moment. Right now, in this moment, today, in this second, you can make the decision to go out and do something that challenges you, to take a risk, to be more courageous, to do something, to express your love, to express your joy, to pursue your talents. Don't wait until something traumatic happens before you decide to really live. She had been living with cancer for 10 years, but it seems based on what I've been able to see online and through research that she's been living her life, living her life, started living her life way before that even happened. You know, we often wait until someone passes to make a foundation in their name and to express all, do all these things to express our love for them. Don't wait. Now is the time. There's no better time than now. Don't wait until something tragic happens before you make the decision, before you choose to step out of your comfort zone and live your life fully. We get one shot. And when it's done, it's a wrap, at least on this earthly plane. Make the best of your time here. Give the best of who you are while you're here so that your time is not wasted and so that those who love you and you love know it now, they feel it now, they experience it now, so that when it is time for your transition and we're all going to have to go there someday, that when it's time you can say, I did it. I don't know where I'm going next, but this lifetime, my time here on earth, I squeeze as much joy, love, excitement, exuberance, and adventure than one person possibly could in one lifetime. And I am ready for my next adventure. All right, so 
that's all. I look forward to joining you or being with you next week. Again, you can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on LinkedIn. I look forward to being in this space with you again next week. But in the meantime, until I see you again, make sure that you bring the best of who you are to every moment, to everything that you do. Take care, and I'll see you soon.